Hi, my name is Dr. Rich Hills, and you're watching my channel, Knife Skills. Today, I want to talk to you about the craziest procedure I do. I get asked that question all the time. What is the craziest operation that you do as a trauma surgeon? And of course, that's a hard question because the people who are asking it are looking for blood, quite literally. But today, I think I'll appease some people and I'll answer some of those questions by describing the most crazy, most intense surgery a trauma surgeon does. And that is the resuscitative thoracotomy or quote unquote, cracking the chest. So today we're going to talk about it in two parts. First of all, I'm going to talk to everyone, lay people, people who enjoy just watching medical YouTubes. I'm going to talk to you first about what is a resuscitative thoracotomy, generally why we do it, how we do it, those type of details. Then on the second half for medical students and residents, I'm going to go into more details. We're going to go into the nitty gritty. Like how do you actually do it? What are the actual indications? You know, what is it about this, this procedure? So if you're a medical student, stick around to the end. You can even fast forward to that part if you want to learn more about how that procedure is done. But for the first part, for most people stick around to the beginning. Okay. So what is a resuscitative thoracotomy. What's, what's the point? Well, sometimes you'll hear the expression cracking the chest, internal cardiac massage, cross clamping the aorta. Really a trauma thoracotomy is all of those things. You'll see them on medical shows, ER, Grey's Anatomy, etc. cetera. You'll, you'll hear reference to this procedure because it is a, a fairly intense, fairly uh, dramatic attempt to bring someone back to life, so to speak. So we, we do this procedure really for two broad indications in trauma. Patients can die for multiple reasons, but there's two reasons that we're aiming to correct with a resuscitative thoracotomy. The first reason maybe a little less common than the second, but the one that we're really hoping to, to have is something called obstructive shock. So obstructive shock can occur for a number of reasons, but the one that we're most worried about is something called cardiac tamponade. Imagine this scenario. There's a patient, they've been stabbed in the chest. There's some injury to the heart from the knife and it's bleeding from the heart into the pericardium or the sac that surrounds the heart. Now the pericardium is a really important structure, but it doesn't stretch much. And so if blood rapidly enters that pericardium, it's going to put pressure on the heart. It's going to squeeze the heart and prevent the heart from filling. So that causes an obstruction or an obstructive shock. And that can cause the patient to have a cardiac arrest and die. So when we do resuscitative thoracotomy, we're actually hoping that's the cause, because if we open up that sac, free the heart, the heart can then fill properly, can pump properly. And the patient will usually respond actually to that type of treatment. Now we're also left with the challenge of damage to the heart itself and the heart is beating and that becomes a more advanced issue of how we're going to like stop the actual bleeding from the heart. But really that's much easier to control than compression on the heart from cardiac tamponade. So the other indication for a resuscitative thoracotomy is what's called hemorrhagic shock. So someone's again involved in a, a trauma, it could be a penetrating trauma, it could be a blunt trauma and they're, they've more or less bled to death. Well, putting a cross clamp on the aorta as part of a resuscitative thoracotomy can prevent ongoing bleeding. It can also give some resistance for the heart to pump against, which can help improve blood flow to the heart itself and improve blood flow to the brain. So part of this resuscitative thoracotomy is this idea of cross clamping the aorta, and it can help in certain types of hemorrhagic shock. Hemorrhagic shock that comes from, say, a gunshot wound or, or penetration wound to like the neck, that type of approach isn't actually that helpful. And a lot of guidelines do actually recognize, oh, you know, that's maybe not the best indication for this resuscitative thoracotomy. So once we've had the heart released from its pericardium, once we've cross clamped the aorta, the other thing we can do is assist the heart through cardiac massage. And, uh, we can use certain drugs and things like that to help stimulate the heart at this point in time. And that's one of the other, uh, effects that we could have by using this procedure, that resuscitative thoracotomy. 
Of course, the story is not done. The cause of the trauma is still there. We have to take them to the operating room and, and fix that. And that can sometimes be a multidisciplinary approach. Um, but that is what we're hoping for with this receptive thoracotomy. We're hoping to find that tamponade, stop the ongoing bleeding, and get the patient up to the operating room so we can do definitive care. Now, resuscitative thoracotomy is a dramatic procedure. And it's been something that I've had an opportunity to do throughout my training, in my practice, but the chances of surviving a resuscitative thoracotomy are very low. There are many trauma surgeons who go through their career and, and have you know maybe one or maybe even zero saves from a resuscitative a thoracotomy. It truly is like a Hail Mary procedure for trauma. And I would say that although obviously it's dramatic, it is has its own technical challenges, the real hard part about a resuscitative thoracotomy is actually the decision to do it, when to do it, why to do it, who to do it on. It's a dramatic procedure both for the patient, obviously uh, they're uh, dying and it's uh, morbid for them, uh, it puts you as a provider at risk. There are knives kind of coming in and out of the field quickly. There's a risk of injury. It's emotionally difficult and demanding on the healthcare system as well. So lots of reasons that are hard to, to do this, uh, procedure. And so you want to pick and choose the patients the right way. And those indications are really, really important. So that's it for those people who really aren't interested in how we do it. They don't want more details. If you're interested, I have a link up here that you can click on that can get you uh, to something a bit more comfortable than what we're about to talk about next. But for those of you who are excited about trauma and are maybe uh, med students or residents that are interested in learning more, uh, stick around. We're going to talk about it in more detail right now. So how do we do a resuscitative thoracotomy? Well, let's take it step by step. The first step is to incise the chest. You take a large scalpel, like a 10 blade or 21 blade, and then you find the fifth intercostal space. Usually it's below the nipple. Then you take your knife and you incise the skin from the sternum all the way down to as far back as you can go. Usually, as we say, to the bed. Then the next step is to take shears usually, and then incise the intercostal muscles, making available access between the ribs so you can place your retractor. So then the next step, step two, is to place your finish at a retractor or your rib spreader between the ribs. One important point that's worth mentioning is that when you place the finishetto, you want to make sure that the handle of the finishetto is posteriorly. You want to have it towards the bed. The reason why that's important is because one of the things that you may need to do is bring the thoracotomy across to the other side of the chest. Okay. And that's called a clamshell thoracotomy. Okay. So it's really important that you recognize that and, uh, have the finishetto facing the correct side. Then once that's done, you need to get access to the heart. So that's step three, gain access to the heart. You do this multiple ways. Now you'll, you may find in the readings, they'll talk about releasing the inferior pulmonary ligament. That's very important, especially if you're trying to get access to the aorta, but some people will just push down the lung, just whatever they can to get it out of the way to get access to the heart. Now, if the patient has cardiac tamponade, which we mentioned before as being one of the important indications for doing a thoracotomy, sometimes it can be hard to incise the pericardium. It's tight and it's tense. You'll see in this picture that they're using a pair of scissors, curved Mayo scissors to incise the uh, pericardium. Now, if it's tense and tight, you may not be able to do that. So you actually might need to use a scalpel to put a nick in the pericardium, and then it can be extended through the pericardium with Mayo scissors. The next step then is to release the heart. So once you've incised the pericardium, you can fold the pericardium back. Make sure when you incise the pericardium as described in this picture to do it anterior to the phrenic nerve and parallel to the phrenic nerve because you don't want to divide the phrenic nerve inadvertently while you're doing this procedure. Then you fold the pericardium back, releasing the heart. Now, if they have obstructive shock, like I mentioned before, that will be the main thing that'll help the patient getting it out of that tense, tight pericardial sac. Now, if they have a hole in the heart, that's something you still have to deal with, but that's more or less down the road. You can put a finger on the hole, lots of things you can do to stop the bleeding. Usually the hole isn't big enough to be as hemodynamically significant as truly that the compression from the pericardial sac. So once that's done, that's the most helpful thing that you can do. At this point, you can start to breathe a bit of a sigh of relief. 
it's time to move on to the next step. If that helped the patient, that's great. If it didn't help the patient, now you're kind of in the quote unquote, Hail Mary, lower yield return types of procedures that you'll do to help. So the next step would then be cross clamp the aorta. Now, in order to do that, you need to access the aorta through the pleura. So you have to divide the pleura really just above the spinous uh, vertebral body. And uh, then the aorta is usually the most leftward and posterior structure, tubular structure. And you can place your large debate camp across the aorta at this point or whatever large vascular clamp you might have. Now it could be easy to confuse the esophagus and the heart. Sometimes you clamp the wrong structure can happen and that doesn't help the patient. So a couple tips and tricks, you can have a nasogastric tube down into the esophagus. So it won't be in the aorta. You can feel the difference there. And in my institution, very often we will have a transesophageal probe down at this point. And that's easy thing. That's quite thick. You'll definitely notice that's not in the aorta, uh, when you're going to cross clamp. So that's another, uh, quick, uh, trick. Okay. Now, again, to access the, the, um, per the uh, aorta through the pleural space, you may need to release that inferior pulmonary ligament. And that's another important uh, step in this procedure as well. So once you've done that, you've released the heart, you've cross clamped the aorta. The final thing that you can do is cardiac massage. One of the important tricks you want to do with cardiac massage is use the palms of your hand. You want to, you want to squeeze the heart with the palm of your hand, not with the thumbs, because there's a risk. You put your finger through the atrium and cause more damage. So you want to do flat hands, compress that heart. Okay. You can also compress the heart against the sternum. Now there are a few other nuances that's worth mentioning. One is this so-called clamshell thoracotomy where we extend the, the incision to the other side. Why do we do that? Well, sometimes there's injury to the right side of the heart or injury to the right chest that's causing their hemorrhagic shock. And if we put a chest tube in on that right side and there's a massive amount of bleeding, we can then extend the incision across to the right side and do this so, so-called clamshell thoracotomy. Now, one thing you should be doing is even before you've started your resuscitative thoracotomy, you really should have put a chest tube on that side because a, um, a tension pneumothorax can be a cause of obstructive shock and it can be one of those causes of reversible shock that can cause the patient to, to, to die. So bilateral chest tubes usually should be placed even before you start this procedure uh, with a resuscitative thoracotomy, but also recognize that all the other important trauma things need to be done. IV access, endotracheal intubation, again, bilateral chest tubes, transexamic acid, um, massive blood transfusion protocol, whole blood, um, you know, or balance component therapy, are all things that need to be done while you are doing this resuscitative, uh, thoracotomy. So that is the procedure in a nutshell, the technical details. And if you're a layperson sticking around, congratulations. Uh, you've stuck through it. Uh, I'm, I'm impressed. Now, when you're a surgeon, doctor, regardless, it's not enough to know how to do a procedure. And of course, when we're doing a, a trauma thoracotomy, it doesn't end with just cracking the chest, clamping the aorta, releasing the, the heart. You've got to go onto the operating room and repair the injury, assuming the patient has recovered, at least from the resuscitative point. They've actually got their heart back. They got their pulse back. So it's not just enough to know how to do it. You got to know when, and when you're dealing with the resuscitative thoracotomy, that can be difficult. There's many guidelines out there. There's the West algorithm, there's East guidelines. And then most of us will kind of find our own approach. And so I tend to lean towards these guidelines and they break it down into really four separate categories. They have the situation where the patients has penetrating trauma and they have a cardiac arrest in the hospital. The situation where the patient has penetrating trauma and they have a cardiac arrest before they get to the hospital patients, when they have blunt trauma and they have a cardiac arrest in the hospital. And then lastly, patients who have a blunt arrest and have a cardiac arrest prior to arrival to the hospital. So each of these separate indications have a different value. So let's start with the first one, the penetrating trauma that is in the trauma bay, they have vital signs and they lose vital signs in the trauma bay. Well, this is the best case scenario. This is the situation again, is most likely to be cardiac tamponade. You're most likely to have an impact by doing the resuscitative th thoracotomy. And most guidelines would say, recommend going ahead and proceeding with that procedure. The next scenario is when someone has a pre-hospital rest, but did so because of penetrating trauma. Now this has a little less value for a number of reasons. You don't know how long the patient has been down. You don't know really all those other circumstances. So you really want to think about a few things. First of all, 
Did they have penetrating trauma to the neck? That would be a situation where a resuscitative thoracotomy is not likely to help. Another thing to think about is how long were they down? Is it five minutes versus 15 minutes? Anything longer than that, it's unlikely to be helpful, for example. Another tool that can help you is evaluating the patient with an ultrasound. So there's a big paper out of LA by Kenji Naba that basically says that if the patient doesn't have any cardiac activity on the ultrasound when they arrive in hospital, this is that pre-hospital arrest situation, there really isn't much value in doing the thoracotomy. That's the, the general gist of that paper. So if the patient has cardiac activity, a short downtime, otherwise has appropriate physiology from this penetrating injury, that's a good indication to do a resuscitative thoracotomy. Now, the blunt traumas are also a challenge. Again, someone who has a blunt trauma and then arrests in hospital, the value of a resuscitative thoracotomy is relatively low. I do think I would do it in most situations if I had a patient in front of me, then they had a cardiac arrest, and, and they certainly have, but we know that the survivability of that is low. Now, we can take a step further. We have the same blunt trauma patient who has a, a, a cardiac arrest prior to arriving to hospital. That patient, most guidelines would recommend not proceeding with a resuscitative thoracotomy. But certainly you can consider evaluating the patient with an ultrasound, doing some of those other things to help guide your decision. And certainly I've been faced with that dilemma uh, many times in my career. So again, when you're thinking about doing a resuscitative thoracotomy, you want to think about it in one of those three categories. Well, if you're a medical student and you found that useful, please leave a comment below. I'm always interested in knowing what you want me to create. It was really comments from other videos that inspired me to make this video. And that's kind of what keeps me going. So I'd appreciate any comments, likes, obviously a subscribe. I'm really here to connect with you people in this community. And if you're a layperson, you've stuck around to the end. Well, amazing. Congratulations. I mean, I'm, I'm impressed. We've gone through some fairly technical details on really the craziest procedure that I do, which is the resuscitative thoracotomy. Anyway, my name is Dr. Rich Hillsden. Thank you for watching and have a great day.